Okay. Thank you so much for joining me and for spending spending this day or this morning with me. Um, this is one of my very favorite topics because I think it's just so foundational to practice whether you are new or seasoned in hormone testing and prescribing, you're in the right place. Um, even if you've never set out to test or focus on hormones, like so many of my colleagues tell me, uh, you may have found that you're needing to, you know, deal with them anyhow. Um, so we all need to be well-versed in how to treat it. So hopefully today's webinar will help you uh, get to that point. I'm going to focus on reading hormone profiles and treating based on that data. I'll mostly be speaking about salivary testing, which I'll explain the reasoning behind that as we go. So just as an overview so far, you know, we've got a few different steps to follow. We certainly want to gather the clinical history and goals, risk factors, possible disease prevention areas, quality of life, disease management, and educate our patients on all of their options. Then we're going to be testing. Um, I will mention mostly today about the salivary sex hormone profile. We're going to be prescribing, following their symptoms, and then retesting to ensure that we've got them in that optimal place. So before we consider hormone replacement, you might want to just be thinking about all of these types of assessments. So the clinical history, definitely their last menstrual period and their present, presence of a uterus or lack thereof, physical exam, some basic serum testing, uh, maybe a PAP breast screening, endometrial screening. These are not all required, but they are just things to consider as you move forward with the patient, even a DEXA. Um, I think it would be amazing if we had all of these baselines before we started with each and every patient. That's not always uh, realistic, but certainly things to think about. We want to look at their risks, um, their symptoms as well, the severity of their symptoms, their risk of things like osteoporosis or fracture, cardiovascular risk, dementia, uh, cancers like colon, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer. And I've linked a couple of different calculation tools that you can use to assess. Um, their risk of biliary issues or pancreatitis, if they've ever had those things in the past, you want to be mindful because uh, specifically it's oral estrogen that's been shown to increase those and then the risk for osteoarthritis, okay? We always wanna just be taking into account this individual's priorities, their values, their fears, their concerns, just making sure we're individualizing this so it's not just us you know, telling them what's going on, but really listening to uh, their, their concerns. If you want a starting place for a really great intake questionnaire in your menopausal patients, the um, I, I still in my head refer to them as NAMS, the North American Menopause Society. They've recently changed their name. You can find this um, this full questionnaire. It's quite comprehensive. So you might take pieces of this and use as a template. You can certainly use the whole thing. I tend to use uh, some of it, but not all of it, and use that as a starting point for your intake form. And then as far as treatments, we're thinking about certainly the foundation and working our way from there. So diet, exercise, lifestyle factors in general, those are always going to be part of our treatment goals, uh, potentially nutraceuticals, botanicals, whether those are phytoestrogens or not. And then thinking about bioidentical hormones, pharmaceutical versions or compounded versions, and then synthetic hormones. Now, when I say synthetic, I just want to describe, we're typically referring to non-bioidentical pharmaceutical options or conventional options. Um, so, you know, with those and with all hormones in general, we, we want to use the appropriate type, the appropriate dose, the appropriate formula, the appropriate route of administration, and then the duration to meet our treatment objectives. There's a whole lot of nuance within all of that, as I'm sure you know. And we can also think about uh, non-hormonal prescriptions, over-the-counter um, things, certain medications. And I do want to go back to that term synthetic. Technically, synthetic just means it was made in a laboratory. So certainly all bioidentical hormones and all conventional therapies, pharmaceutical therapies are technically synthetic. But when we're using that term, you know, in, in common language, we're usually referring to synthetic, meaning 
kind of pharmaceutical, non-bioidentical. So those terms can get kind of confusing. All right, so let's go through all of your options as far as treatments and what you have available to you. As far as pharmaceutical options, there are oral prescriptions for estrogen. We have estradiol, esterified estrogens, and conjugated equine estrogens. I have listed in bold, so you'll see for all of these upcoming slides, everything in bold is bioidentical. And so typically that's what I'm choosing in, in clinical practice if I have the option. Um, the esterified estrogens are synthetic combination of estrogens. Conjugated equine estrogen is certainly uh, a, a large combination of different types of estrogen. So I will definitely choose the estradiol, which is the bioidentical form. Um, this is an oral estrogen and progestin combo. Uh, some of these portions have a bioidentical estradiol portion of that, but there's no bioidentical progesterone in any of these oral estrogen progestin combinations. They're all uh, conventional pharmaceutical synthetics, so non-bioidentical progesterone or progestins. Okay. There are definitely... On the other side of this, not, not oral, but transdermal options. So we have patches. These are all bioidentical. I do use these in clinical practice quite a bit. I think there's a lot of um, advantages here. Some individuals you may find have skin sensitivities or irritation rashes that can develop from the patches themselves. So do keep in mind, there's many different brands um, and, and different options that you can try. Sometimes I've had patients really react to one and they don't react to the other. It's, it's a little tricky to, to find out exactly what's in some of the, these non-active ingredients, which are within the adhesives. Um, but you can certainly switch and try a different, different brand. They come in once weekly or twice weekly options. Again, they are, all are bioidentical. And then you have these combi patches, as we call them, transdermal estrogen and progestin. The estradiol within these is bioidentical. Of course, the progestin is not. I tend not to use those in my practice and not to say that, that that's not an option, but um, I do stick to those bioidentical estradiol patches quite a bit. They're all, uh, there's gels and sprays. These are also bioidentical. And there's an intravaginal ring. You'll see this ring here listed. There's gonna be a ring on the next slide. The difference between these, this one is a higher dose meant for treating systemically, meant for treating vasomotor symptoms and other symptoms of menopause. Occasionally you'll have women that are not, um, you know, true, I would say, candidates for systemic estrogen therapy. And so in those cases, you can use a low dose vaginal sometimes. These are bioidentical. They have a ring, a vaginal tablet, and a vaginal cream. They also have a conjugated equine estrogen cream. I tend not to use that. I stick to the bioidentical estradiol, so you'll see that listed in bold. So these are considered lower dose. They're usually treating genitourinary symptoms of menopause. They're not necessarily treating things like brain fog and some of these other more systemic type um, situations. Now, I will argue that even those low dose um, doses are being delivered systemically, though they are at a lower dose than, than the ones that I list, the one that I listed previously. There are also intramuscular options. You have uh, two different options here. Both are bioidentical. Uh, these are considered ester pro drugs. So they have a side arm of an ester, which is cleaved when the drug is absorbed after that injection happens. And so these are considered to be bioidentical. They are that 17 beta estradiol, which is the bioidentical form. There are uh, less options here for progesterone. We certainly have the synthetic progestins. These are not bioidentical. They are a slightly different molecule than what the body makes naturally. There's an oral micronized progesterone. You'll probably be very familiar with this. It goes under the generic name of Prometrium. 
Um, interesting to note just that it does contain a peanut oil. So just something to think about if you have patients with nut allergies, there's more and more people with those nowadays. So something to remember. And then there is a vaginal progesterone that is bioidentical. It's typically used for um, women with fertility issues. And so um, not, not the standard uh, prescription for perimenopause or menopausal patients. Okay, so just as a summary, there are quite a few bioidentical pharmaceutical options, if that's what you would like to go for, that contain estradiol. So these products are definitely improvement, I would say, from the equine and maybe ethanol estrogens that you find in birth control, um, but they are still more or less kind of a one-size-fits-all package and contain just estradiol. If you're looking for a biased formula that contains estriol, just keep in mind that that's not currently FDA approved here in the United States, um, but and it, it, not FDA approved to treat menopausal symptoms. So there is um, estriol that can be purchased over the counter. Um, you can also prescribe this in a biased formulation or estriol specifically through a compounding pharmacy. And as I mentioned, not a lot of options with progesterone, though you do have that oral micronized prometrium that is bioidentical or the vaginal gel um, as well. Again, that's often used for patients struggling with fertility. In the United States, we have a lot of over-the-counter bioidentical hormone options. Um, and when I say over-the-counter, there are certainly standard over-the-counter um, over medications, uh, but also those that are only able to be given through a uh, professional line, um, online dispensary type of thing. Uh, so the, those are kind of two caveats to that, but I'm putting them under the umbrella of over-the-counter. Okay, so there's creams, there's orals, there's sublinguals, and there's vaginal suppositories. There are single hormones and combinations available. We have progesterone, estradiol, estriol, DHEA, and progesterone combined with chrysin is available for men. Essentially, everything that we have discussed so far or will discuss is available over-the-counter with the exception of testosterone and then oral hydrocortisone, okay? So uh, the majority of those are bioidentical and certain brands come to mind that I use quite frequently. That may be something we discuss at a later time, maybe in um, our discussion after, after today's lecture. Then you also have oral. Um, we're talking about the route of administration here, and I'll just say some pros and cons um, just so that we're all on the same page here. Easy to monitor. That's the great thing about them. Um, they're easy for most patients. They're very familiar with taking oral pills. The risk of transference is quite low almost nil. Uh, the major disadvantage really is this first pass metabolism. And you'll see this kind of be its main disadvantage as we talk through today. For oral estrogens, that's leading to things like lowered IGF-1 levels. It actually raises acute phase proteins and increases cardiovascular risk. The downside with oral progesterone is that the vast majority of that is metabolized to allopregnenolone. And that can be a benefit in one aspect. Stimulates GABA receptors can be very beneficial to the nervous system, support sleep cycles. But the problem with that is that if we're looking to get our tissue levels up of progesterone, we're thinking just about 10% of that orally delivered progesterone actually ends up kind of staying in the body and staying at that tissue level. So if that is your therapeutic goal, just keep that in mind that oral isn't going to be the way to really get those tissue levels up and protect the breast, the brain, things like that. I will talk about the endometrium. I have some um, opinions on that that may differ from the standard of care. And then uh, with testosterone, do keep in mind that the oral delivery, which is the only pharmaceutical available option for women, is hepatotoxic. And then oral estrogens, I've talked about some of the downsides there, but they can also increase blood pressure, triglycerides, they can increase estrone levels, which we typically aren't looking for. It's been linked to gallstones and pancreatitis. It can elevate liver enzymes, as I mentioned, decrease IGF-1, and it also increases sex hormone binding globulin. Remember, sex hormone binding globulin really has the greatest affinity to testosterone. So it's going to bind testosterone, lowering that 
free level and causing maybe things like low libido or decrease in vitality, stamina, uh, muscle mass, and then also increased CRP and phase one inflammatory markers. It has been shown that giving estrogen orally actually negates many of the cardiovascular effects and protective effects that estrogen is known to have when produced endogenously. And then giving it with the progestin is also detrimental um, to that cardiovascular system. That's kind of outside of the scope of today's lecture, but uh, we can talk about that in detail. There's, there's a lot of data to show that that's happening. It's not just testosterone that can be lowered by oral estrogen. We also see thyroid and cortisol can be increasingly bound because of that sex hormone binding globulin and other binding globulins. Um, in this study, they were looking at oral estradiol administration associating with increased sex hormone binding globulin and total testosterone, but it decreased the free portion of testosterone. They also looked at thyroid hormone. We saw a total T4 increase, but a decrease in the total in the free T4. And um, so just to, as a reminder here, we're talking about unwanted effects that are more than just the sex hormones, but even on things like thyroid hormone and cortisol levels. So this slide goes into more detail about oral and transdermal estrogens. It's quite wordy, so I'll just give you the high points that basically topical hormones, when we're thinking about those, we're bypassing liver metabolism. So we don't cause a lot of these high concentrations in the liver like we do with oral forms, especially estrogen and testosterone. Transdermal estrogen does not result in these same inflammatory and coagulation markers that we see with the oral. Both oral and transdermal improve HDL to LDL ratios. Transdermal has a more favorable effect on the triglycerides. Okay, we see less weight gain with transdermal estradiol and more importantly, less metabolic syndrome. And as I already mentioned, that oral estradiol can increase sex hormone binding globulin, which decreases bioavailable testosterone, which can decrease libido probably something that's already um, potentially a problem during perimenopause and menopause. So not ideal. This article is looking at the potential of transdermal estradiol and progestin to be a safer postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. And the authors are concluding, yes, that you know they've established those cardiovascular risk factors that we see with oral estradiol. We just don't see those with the transdermals. Um, they also found that the non-oral therapies can actually offer blood pressure control, not just causing that to worsen. And then they do point out really that we, we need to make this notable difference between progestins and progesterones. In the research, you'll often see them lumped together under the term progestogen and studied comprehensively like that. Or mistakenly, I've many times seen something that is a progestin named progesterone. And I think that just really muddles um, what we're trying to delineate here, which is what is the safest, most effective thing for our patients. Progestins, when they're combined with oral progesterone, are linked to DVTs, pulmonary embolisms, and breast cancer. And then progesterone doesn't look to carry any of those same risks and actually has favorable actions on the vessels and the brain. So general estrogen guidelines, estradiol is going to be preferred over conjugated equine estrogen um, due to that bioidentical nature, even the esterified estrogens or ethanol estradiol. Uh, transdermal is best in most cases if you have that choice. You want to avoid estro oral estrogen in, I would argue, all cases. However, technically in those with hypertriglyceride the anemia, gallbladder disease, thrombophilias like factor V Leiden, and even migraines with aura, if possible. Now, oral estrogen is sometimes with some insurance plans, what's going to be the lowest cost. And so in some cases, really, that you, those benefits are still going to outweigh the risks. However, if you have the option, um, do attempt to go for those transdermals. A standard dose of one milligram oral estradiol is considered to be equivalent to a transdermal patch of 0.05. Those are both considered standard doses, okay? It is encouraged that you try to start lower and titrate up to relieve symptoms. So a 0.5 oral 
and a 0 0.025 of a patch. Those would be the suggestions, okay? This is my opinion. Now, what you see with this asterisk, this is my opinion. You'll never, you won't see this listed on any uh, research papers, but I have seen that a transdermal biased cream of 0 0.2 estradiol and 0 0.8 of estriol is approximately therapeutically equivalent to these standard dosage that are used in the conventional system. So that one milligram oral or 0 0.2. 0 0.05 of a patch. Um, this is because the, the reason you're not going to see this listed this way is because usually these bigger research papers are using serum testing. And there's a lot of nuance here. I would argue that transdermals are not best tracked in serum. You really have to dose them quite high to get them to move the serum levels at all. And so what you're missing is this kind of a saturation at the tissue site that you easily pick up with saliva that's actually more representative of the tissue level. So I tend to be able to dose these lower in a transdermal cream and still get the same effects. Um, and the research papers probably aren't going to agree with this. So keep that in mind, take it for what you will. Uh, that is not um, hands down uh, the, the general consensus out there, but that's what I've found from years of clinical practice. Okay, with transdermal, um, you have many advantages here. It's easy to apply. The primary advantage, of course, is that we're not subject to that first pass metabolism in the liver. That's a big deal, uh, especially for estrogen and testosterone. And we can easily monitor this with salivary testing. I argue that you're really going to be missing the correct value if you're testing in urine or serum with transdermals. Okay. The patches and suppositories fall under this transdermal category. Patches are usually applied twice per week, which is nice. It's not you know, an everyday thing. A lot of women find that convenient. And then the suppositories deliver hormone directly to the target tissues, as well as being systemically absorbed. So there can be some benefit there, especially if we're talking about vaginal dryness. The disadvantage, uh, number one here, is the risk of transference to others. So if that's children in the household, spouses, even pets. With the patches, that's not so much of an issue at all. But even suppositories, if you think about intercourse, there is the potential to transfer that to partners. There's a small risk of contamination when using saliva testing. So you just have to get ahead of this and make sure to tell your patients that this is a possibility. Discuss proper hygiene. Um, and make sure the patients prevent hormone exposure to others or get any of that hormone into the salivary tube, which is going to make the levels look sky high, even though they're not sky high in their tissues, okay? With the suppositories, exposure to the partner can be minimized by just changing the timing of the dose, if possible. And then there's an, another disadvantage here. There's an unpredictable release of hormone when the hormone is stored in adipose tissue. Remember, transdermal steroid hormones are lipophilic. They like to hang around in adipose tissue. And so if it's applied over areas of fatty tissue, say the abdomen, the buttocks, um, the thighs, the inner arm right here, there can be this kind of pooling effect that happens. And then the hormone gets released at inconsistent amounts. You may see salivary testing look lower than you were expecting or higher than you were expecting. If that happens, I would always go back and ask the patient, where are they applying it? I found that a lot of these over-the-counter bioidentical prescriptions, the label says to apply them to fatty areas, breast tissue, things like that. I do not do that. I have my patients apply them directly to thin skinned areas. So the inner wrist right here, tops of the feet, backs of the knees, we want that going directly to those small capillaries and not getting stuck in that adipose tissue and not being delivered through the body. So doctor's data does offer both salivary and urinary testing. So whatever tool you like to use, it's available to you. Providers are a lot of times asking what is the best medium to monitor hormone replacement or bioidentical hormone replacement. So you can see the recommendations here. I'm gonna make this kind of brief and not bore you with a ton of details. However, if you do want more information on this, there was a webinar that was done in January of this year. You can go to that um, to the website and pull that up and watch it. It's all about testing medium comparisons. And we go into more detail about the reasoning behind this. There's physiologic reasonings why salivary hormone will show 
all of the different potential types, endogenous production, oral, topical, vaginal, sublingual pellets. You just don't have to worry about it. You could do everything there. Um, there are other areas where serum or urine, you might be able to pick that up. There's a lot of caveats there. I find it to be much more confusing and easily get you off track when you're trying to dose correctly, especially, and this is kind of the whole point today, is that bypassing that first uh, liver metabolism is really the goal. That's what most of us are going to be choosing because it's uh, less you know, we're, we're risk averse. We don't want to harm our patients. We're going to be choosing transdermal as much as possible. And that's really where the salivary hormone is going to be your best bet to track the dose appropriately. I find that if people are using serum or urine testing, sometimes they're really overdosing their patients transdermally because of the physiology of the way those hormones are absorbed, okay? So these are our transdermal dosage considerations. You can see for a bias formulation, progesterone, testosterone, or DHEA, you wanna consider these dosages for premenopausal women interested in conception. For premenopausal women not interested in conceiving, postmenopausal women and men. So we have that all laid out for you. If you follow these dosage guidelines in your patients that do, you know, need hormone replacement and you follow this fairly closely, you will get reasonable uh, levels in the uh, saliva testing. You might have to do a little bit of maneuvering. Uh, everyone's slightly different, but this will give you a really, really close guideline. This is a handout that lives on the doctor's data website, can be shared with patients, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, and it's all about ways to limit exogenous exposure and transference. That's probably one of the most confusing things with salivary testing is if patients aren't being careful and they're kind of, you know, swapping their, their transdermal hormones all over the place and just unaware that the potential of this exists, you're going to see really high levels in saliva that just don't make sense, right? So probably some of the most common um, reasons that you'll see transference or contamination would be, uh, you know, males using testosterone at home with females, and maybe you're testing your female patient and you're seeing these really odd high levels. It's a very common way to get that. Um, if women go to, say, a gym, it's quite common that men there are using things like androgel or these really high potent topical uh, hormones and accidentally kind of getting that all over the gym equipment. And then, you know, we're going in and touching that and the, the salivary levels can be elevated. You might be surprised. There's quite a few, you know, places in our daily lives where we can be exposed to, you know, uh, either a transient or a stable level, a consistent level of exogenous exposure. Um, think about your women who are of perimenopausal or menopausal age. They often have many friends or coworkers are hanging out with, and some of those women may be, might be using transdermal hormone therapies as well. I have seen some odd, um, you know, some, some essential oils actually contain progesterone. So I've certainly caught that in a couple of my patients looking at this high level that doesn't make any sense because they're not on progesterone therapy. And then they remind me, oh yeah, I do. I use, you know, this type of essential oil and we can see that's where it's coming from. There's also anti-itch creams are really common. They're using it for a small rash and they forgot to tell you that will increase cortisol levels. So that will be um, picked up. Maybe their dog has a rash and they're applying that topically to the dog, right? And then it's on their hands, ends up into their system. One time we had a um, elevated cortisol level that we just couldn't kind of assess with the practitioner and, and couldn't identify. Finally found out the patient was using a medicated lip balm that had hydrocortisone in it. So there are also over-the-counter ways that patients can come into contact with. And so always be thinking through that and teaching your patients about that. Advantages to sublingual hormones is different route of administration, really easy to take. Uh, they, for the most part, don't transfer to others. You can easily alter the dose and it does avoid first pass metabolism for the most part. Some of the sublingual hormone will be delivered orally just by the nature. Patients can't get 100% entirely to absorb under the tongue. And so you will get some of that first pass metabolism. Hopefully it's minimal and you can counsel your patients really to let that absorb as much as possible and to swallow as little as possible. Disadvantages, 
can get a little tricky um, with saliva testing if patients aren't mindful. You can get contamination. Remember, we're using the same hormone, the same medium to deliver the hormone as we are to collect. So if there's any residual hormone left in the oral cavity, we can contaminate the sample by accident. Easily preventable by following the dosage interval guidelines, which we'll discuss in a little bit. And again, just remember patients are going to naturally end up swallowing a small portion of the hormone. It can't entirely be avoided. Um, so that is one downside for estradiol and testosterone specifically just because of that inflammatory first pass effect. So this is an explanation of sublingual hormone um, replacement. The saliva sample for salivary testing should be collected 24 to 36 hours um, following the last use of that hormone. So please note too that sublingual hormones can collect on toothbrushes. To avoid this, you wanna have patients brush their teeth prior to dosing the sublingual hormones so they're not getting a constant kind of re-inoculation there. Um, I occasionally will run into issues with this. I had one patient in all of the time I've done testing that had, we just couldn't get a clean reading and it ends up she had um, some orthodontic things that were glued inside the mouth. And I think they were just able to kind of pick up in those little cavities and pockets and the hormone was just staying there. And so try as we might, we couldn't get a clean reading. Uh, that's the only time I've ever had that issue. So as long as you're counseling patients, shouldn't be a problem. With injected or subcutaneous hormones, you're avoiding first pass metabolism, that's great. And you can't transfer to others or it's very hard to do so. Disadvantages, not ideal for needle phobic patients. Therapies are typically dosed weekly or bi-weekly. So there's a less consistent hormone supply from day to day if we're comparing this to other methods. Okay, probably the biggest downside is that patients just don't love needles and I don't blame them. Hormone pellets. These are inserted under the skin and slowly released somewhere between three and six months, typically. Uh, advantages here, there's no exposure to others. It's not subject to first pass metabolism, which is great. They are semi-permanent so that women love that. Also, you know, some men who are using this, so they don't have to remember to take it daily. I think that's probably the, the biggest benefit here. But along those same lines, in the same vein, that semi-permanence is also a disadvantage. If the dose needs to be altered, you have to wait many, many months to do that. I commonly see patients with their initial pellet insertion just far overdosed with these methods. Their levels are sky high. Women are having anger issues, irritability, acne, facial hair growth, cranial hair loss. Um, and, and then when we get to the three to six month mark, it looks like their hormone levels just kind of bottom out. So I love the idea of these pellets, right? Like having the semi-permanence where life is just a little bit easier logistically for your, for your patients. I just don't see them working in my opinion well, because it's just this massive dose and then it drops. So I, I, that's just my opinion. Okay. You may have had a different experience with them. Um, but that's what I see through the testing and also through uh, patient experience. Another disadvantage is just that they have to be implanted, which is fairly invasive if we're comparing that to other methods. Um, it's actually, you know, I think most patients find them to be, find it to be okay and not horribly invasive, but that is just one thing to consider. All right, let's move on to estriol, uh, otherwise known as E3. It's not FDA approved as a treatment for menopausal symptoms. However, we have plenty of research and clinical experience to tell us that this is the most effective treatment for vaginal dryness that accompanies menopause. And that's because it's theorized that the, the vaginal tissue contains just such a high concentration of these estriol receptors. So it's most often prescribed as a vaginal suppository or a cream. Um, at the same time as increasing estriol levels, it's going to increase the estrogen quotient. This estrogen quotient was a marker developed by Dr. Henry Lemon to assess for breast cancer risk. And I'll show you that on some of the lab testing cases that we have today. It's available over the counter. It's only available as a prescription through compounding. And the, the co common dosing strategy here is to build levels up by giving it daily for one to two weeks, and then 
dropping that down, tapering basically to a few times per week as needed for tissue maintenance and symptom relief. Some things to think about as far as progesterone. Progesterone sensitizes estrogen receptors. This means that the symptoms of estrogen dominance, which a lot of times we're, we're trying to address by using progesterone, can sometimes get worse before they get better. So these are typically symptoms like hot flashes or night sweats, breast tenderness, maybe mood concerns. Um, and it's, it's tree and it should resolve after two to three months of progesterone usage, but it's just a really great thing to kind of forewarn your patients about because it really allows them to have trust in you and know that things aren't actually getting worse, but there's going to be a little bit of a hill to climb and before things can level out. If it's appropriate to prescribe, please do just consider their conception goals first if you have someone who's menstruating. Um, if they're looking for that or not, that's going to change your dosage, um, the, the regimen that you're using throughout the month. You can accomplish slightly different aspects by choosing oral or topical progesterone. Topical, very well absorbed, will raise tissue levels within minutes. But with oral, that vast majority is metabolized to allopregnenolone by the liver, right? Great, because there's a calming effect, can be excellent to aid in anxiety or insomnia if that's what you're looking for. But remember, it's not going to result in a big tissue level change of progesterone that you'll see on saliva testing. So it's very common to have oral progesterone and every single time it's going to look like the progesterone level didn't really come up that that much from baseline. And that's just because of the nature of that oral progesterone. Okay, testosterone considerations. It does require a DEA number to prescribe. Note that um, the pharmaceutical ester test, which is orally delivered methyl testosterone for women is not FDA approved because it's been found to be liver toxic. It's still been, you know, it's been in use since 1964. FDA approval is still pending. And due to that, I steer clear of this one. You can prescribe bioidentical testosterone topically through a compounding pharmacy. And just remember, every time you prescribe testosterone, a portion of that you have to assume is going to be converted to estradiol via aromatization. Some women and men are aromatizing very readily, some are not. So I would always recommend that you test estradiol along with testosterone when you're doing a retest, just to make sure you haven't pushed that too far. An aromatase inhibitor, whether that's natural or otherwise, could be added in an attempt to prevent testosterone from converting to estradiol. And if you can't prescribe testosterone or you prefer not to, just remember there's other ways to support testosterone that are somewhat non-hormonal. You can use DHEA hormonally to try to boost that. It will convert to testosterone and then on to estradiol. There's also non-hormone um, ways to do that as well. Always ask men about conception goals before prescribing testosterone. Exogenously delivered testosterone can inhibit spermatogenesis. And then on to DHEA, we can deliver this orally or topically. I typically recommend oral delivery. It's easy, patients are familiar with that. With topical delivery, it does seem to compete a little bit for absorption with other transdermal hormones, especially progesterone. So to avoid that, it's easy enough to just get oral DHEA. It's well absorbed, you'll see that on testing. Remember that DHEA can and will convert to testosterone and then onto estrogen in both men and women. Kind of depends on the individual as to how readily that occurs. So I never guess, I just retest so I know exactly, you know, what, what is going on. Um, and then be particularly careful when you're supplementing women who potentially are overweight. DHEA uh can increase estradiol levels. Remember, it goes from DHEA to testosterone and then on to estradiol through aromatization. Aromatization is most efficient in adipose tissue. And so sometimes you'll just be creating too much testosterone or too much estradiol for that individual patient. With cortisol supplementation, remember that uh, we're typically looking at this for a phase three HPX is dysfunction. Prescribing cortisol is not 
fixing atriaxis dysfunction. It's providing near physiologic levels of cortisol to allow that particular body to function and to reduce symptoms while the HPA axis is recovering underneath. Okay. We want to avoid going over 20 milligrams in a day total, because that's where we find uh, immune suppression to happen, cortisol suppression to happen. And that 20 milligrams per day is what a healthy set of adrenal glands typically produces in a 24 hour period. So as a suggestion, you could start with five to 10 milligrams upon waking, and then an optional additional dose around noontime of maybe five milligrams. That would be very typical. To clarify, sometimes there's this idea that compounding pharmacies or compounded medications are not regulated by the FDA. That is true, but it's because they're governed at a state level and not a federal level. So I think this is sometimes an argument that will be used to say, you know, we just can't trust what's coming out of compounding pharmacies. Uh, but compounding pharmacies are required to prove that their products have the ingredients they state they contain. And in fact, they're very often held to much more strict manufacturing guidelines than the larger pharmaceutical companies. I'm sure we've all heard of this. Um, so I have a lot of respect and um, gratefulness for compounding pharmacies. They have amazing doses. You can pick any dose. You can really um, individualize your treatment approach. And they oftentimes, if you call these compounding pharmacies and speak to their pharmacists, you know, they can come up with some amazing formulas that you might not have thought about for treating certain symptoms. So they're just such a, such a great resource. So I've included some resources here for you to take a peek at if you want to find a compounding pharmacy in your area um, and look into their credentialing. So here's a big topic, endometrial protection. Um, it is known and it is a fact that women with a uterus do need a progestin or a progesterone to protect the endometrium from estrogen replacement. Um, and it's pro it particularly is that proliferation that can happen with estrogen replacement. So if you're giving estrogen and that woman has a uterus, you need to give a progestin or a progesterone. Obviously, as you can tell so far, I'm in favor of the progesterone for several different reasons. Um, it's safer for the cardiovascular system, safer for the breast tissue and the brain. As is commonly talked about now, 200 milligrams orally for at least 12 days out of the month or 100 milligrams per day, that's taken at bedtime because it does have that kind of sedative effect. Um, that is the dose that is known to be most well accepted for protecting against a standard dose of estrogen. So one milligram oral or 0 0.05 milligrams transdermally. Now, in my opinion, again, this is my opinion. It is quite against the conventional system. So I want to be careful here and have you understand this that I do believe 20 to 30 milligrams of transdermal progesterone will be protecting the endometrium and probably more so even than the oral. Now, if you, if you use that, you're really setting yourself up for potential risk. So I'm going to say that with this asterisk to be very careful with that. Um, you can do transvaginal ultrasounds or biopsies at like a six month mark or a year mark your mark just to make sure that everything is okay. I progesterone and a topical at the same time because I feel more comfortable. I can see those tissue levels coming up in the saliva, but I know I'm following what is the most well-accepted research at this point. My hope is that larger studies will come out in the future showing that these transdermal progesterones are protecting the endometrium. However, keep in mind that there are, um, you know, funding issues and things like that that are working against the potential that that might happen. A hundred milligram of oral progesterone, I roughly equate to 10 milligrams of topical progesterone. So you can see in the research, the higher the oral progesterone dose, the greater the, the protective endometrial effect. The problem is when they got to like 400 milligrams orally, the endometrium was very well protected, but then we saw an increased risk of breast health issues. So we typically don't want to push that, which is kind of why I have decided I'm going to do the oral transdermal combo. So we're getting the best of each and not pushing the oral too high. 
Okay. Vaginal bleeding in women who are receiving hormone therapy might require an evaluation of that endometrium. I don't think that's ever a bad idea to just send them straight to transvaginal ultrasound or biopsy. That's totally fine. But do realize that it's common to have vaginal bleeding after hormone therapy is first started. Like it's a pretty clear reason for that to happen. But if you're at all hesitant, it's a great idea to send them um, for a workup. Common side effects with estrogen, breast soreness, that can often be minimized by lowering the dose. If you need to work back up, great. Maybe you can just get away with that lower dose. Some women experience mood symptoms and bloating with progestins or progesterone. Again, if it's bad enough, you can lower the dose and work back up. Vaginal bleeding is going to occur in almost all women receiving a cyclical estrogen progestogen regimen and sometimes early in the months of a continuous regimen. So you can always drop the dose and see if that doesn't stop things. Continuous regimen is going to be less likely to cause that. Um, and then you also can move to, uh, you know, other, it, other types of therapies if it's a continuous problem and it's affecting their quality of life. We got a little delay here. Let me back up. We're going to talk about um, collection instructions. And when you're giving your patient a test kit, you do want to go over the collection guidelines with them, even if it's just briefly. This is just going to save you a lot of time and headache um, for the future. They need to know what day of their menstrual cycle to collect the test if they are still menstruating. They want to know if they're already on hormone replacement, how long to wait between their last dose and when they're first collecting the sample. That's, I think, probably one of the biggest mistakes um, that patients are using with this test is they're just not following that and maybe they didn't read the directions. So you really want to help guide them first. It, again, will save you a lot of time. They're basically going to freeze the samples at least overnight and then ship out the next day. And this is our best practices for salivary specimen collection. This is ideally information that you could convey to the patient before they go home and collect. But just in case that didn't happen, if you're looking at the test results with your patient and you're seeing levels that just don't make sense, maybe they're higher or lower than expected, we do provide a link on the comments section of the laboratory report, which will take you directly to this best practices guideline. That is for you as a provider to easily pull that up and go through with the patient these, these instructions to make sure they followed it correctly. It will really help you identify some of those those areas. Okay, so with baseline testing for cycling women, we do want to capture the right time of the menstrual cycle. So to capture this luteal surge, we're going to test on day 21 of a standard 28-day cycle, give or take a couple days, so day 19 to 23. The cycles are longer, like 35 days, count back seven to nine days from the end of the cycle. So we're going to test day 26 to 28. I won't read all of these timing instructions, but just know this document is here for you. This is probably one of the most common questions we get from, from, from providers is, you know, with perimenopausal patients, which we're often testing for, when the heck do we do this? Their cycles are so irregular. So this will give you every option. Um, you won't ever, you know, be questioning that again, and we'll just help to guide you and your patients. So if your patient's already on hormone replacement through another provider, they're coming to see you, they're already on it, or you started them and you want to monitor their levels, uh, this instruction booklet with the test kit will give that guidance. It's really common, again, that this is not followed correctly. And so the problem is that the laboratory will be giving you information that maybe isn't clinically helpful to you. Okay. And the question that we're mostly asking is, is my patient on the correct dose? That's what we want to answer and help you answer. So this does have to be followed correctly. So topical, they apply the last topical dose. They need to wait 12 to 24 hours between that dose and when they first start collecting their samples for that day. With sublingual, it's a little bit longer. Remember, we're trying to avoid this contamination issue that can happen. So 12, 24 to 36 hours, followed by a couple glasses of water to wash the oral cavity. Oral, you don't need to do anything different. They can just continue to take that as normal. With things like IM, subcutaneous, or patches, we're looking at a mid-cycle dosage interval. So with Pellets, if they're doing, say, a six-month cycle, you would try to test around month three, okay? So just pick the middle of that dosage cycle and test then. 
For cortisol, typically what you are looking for, I would assume, is the endogenous levels. So if that's true and they're using something like a topical hydrocortisone or an oral hydrocortisone, they need to avoid that if it's safe to do so for four to five days in order to get that cleared and to be able to see the endogenous levels. This is what the uh, survey looks like for your patients. They're going to be filling out these um, symptom questionnaire. And I would highly encourage you to ask your patients to do this. Sometimes it can be a little bit time consuming for them, but I think it's helpful for you as a provider because a lot of times you'll find some interesting information here that didn't come up in the visit. Um, maybe they forgot to tell you or there just wasn't enough time. So you can gather a lot more information that way. And then this section is... Uh, where your patient will fill out their hormone use. So a common issue we find is that patients are not quite understanding what all of these things are, and that's to be fair. So you might want to just help them uh, understand what these columns are. So conjugated equine estrogen, patients are not usually on those. If they are, certainly they'll fill this out. But do remind them, typically the, the areas that they're going to be filling out are here, estradiol, estriol, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, maybe they're using melatonin, um, estradiol and progestin, if they're on birth control pills or progestin only, maybe they have an IUD, um, but do kind of explain that to them so that they can use this appropriately and you can get the best information. So how is the hormone therapy being administered? Is it a patch? Is it intramuscular? How long? between last used and first sample collection. This is super important because if they don't fill this out and then their levels are super high or low, you're gonna wonder, did they do the test correctly? You can go to this form and check with them and make sure they did that as advised. And then what is your dose regimen? Is it once per day, once every two weeks, every six months, right? So uh, that will be very helpful to interpret and the information. Okay, let's move on to our cases. This is our first patient, Jane. She's a premenopausal female, age 31. She's got irregular cycles, insomnia, PMS, breast pain, dysmenorrhea, fatigue, the whole thing, very typical presentation. For premenopausal patients, it's common to order a comprehensive hormone profile. And that's what you're seeing here. So at a bird's eye view, the page on the left, this is page one reflective of her HPA axis function. Page two on the right, values are reflecting gonadal function, her sex hormones. DHEA, you will see, is reported on both the HP axis page and the sex hormone page. It is a pro-hormone for estradiol and testosterone, but it's also coming from the adrenal glands, which is why we put it on both pages here, okay? So that's just a bird's eye view. We'll dive into this, but I will say right off the bat, every time I would check this information. So look at the date that was collected and then look at um, the back of their survey too, to make sure they corrected up, they collected at the correct dosage interval if they're on hormone replacement. You can also use this date collected to check their last menstrual period. You wanna make sure they collected on the appropriate uh, time frame. So hopefully it was around day 21 if they have a 28 day cycle. Sometimes you'll see very low levels across the board. And, and if your patient totally missed that luteal phase window, you're going to have a different interpretation of that. It's not that their levels are low. It's just that they collected, say, on day five when they should have collected on day 21. So these reference ranges that we have are based on that luteal phase. Okay. You can also see the four times for cortisol collections. We report those separately there. And then also remember that we have these hormone comments at the bottom. Sometimes we get caught up, we just see the, the numbers and we forget that all this information is here, uh, all laid out for you. It does provide you quite a lot of information. And then remember, if you want to link to that best practices and the say the numbers look different than what you would assume, you click this and go over it with your patient right there in the visit um, and ask them if they followed that correctly. Okay, so here we can see that Jane's progesterone is quite low. It's at 36. The reference range for a premenopausal woman is 127 to 446. This number right here you can see is a supplementation range. There's quite a large therapeutic range for progesterone. Okay, so the level is low enough that 
when I read this report, I'm assuming that this was an anovulatory cycle. The vast majority of progesterone is created from the corpus luteum after ovulation. And so if her level is drastically low, I can pretty distinctly say that she did not ovulate. Now, whether that's occurring every single month or just this time when she collected is a little hard to say, but you know we can fit that into the clinical picture. Okay. So in this case, what I want to do is support ovulation, support that luteal phase. This patient is desiring to conceive. That's one other caveat I'm throwing in here. Um, and she also has progesterone insufficiency symptoms. Okay. This is her question, uh, symptom questionnaire, and it really helps to put her hormone results into context. So again, you'll often see that patients reveal symptoms here that maybe haven't come up uh, for whatever reason in your office visit. So you can see she's talking about stress, fatigue, breast symptoms, um, so that's all, you know, things that she came in or with her chief complaints, her height and weight is listed that can help you determine hormone dosing. If you do use transdermal, um, therapies, and then the last menstrual period helpful to determine if they collected on the correct day. Okay. So Jane's treatment plan, we're going to include cyclical herbal tinctures to support follicular and luteal phase. I'm also going to add 30 milligrams of progesterone topically in the second half of her cycle. Note that if Jane weighed over 150 pounds, we would have simply doubled that starting progesterone dose. And I will say the use of progesterone in this case is optional. In my view, the most important thing is to accomplish and improve ovulation. Um, and Jane's low progesterone is telling us that that's not happening. Supplementing progesterone is not necessarily going to increase the likelihood of ovulation, but it can help to support implantation if conception does occur. And it's going to attach to the progesterone receptors that's going to help with symptom management until Jane is able to make her own. So I'm doing a cyclical herbal tincture that is... Um, a formula out in professional line supplements. So I won't describe all of that, but what it is meant to do is support ovulation. Okay, so Jane's treatment plan with those herbal tinctures, supporting follicular and luteal phase, and 30 milligrams in the second half of the cycle. Again, I chose that because she's premenopausal, interested in conceiving, progesterone 20 to 30 milligrams, days 15 to 28. So you do want to keep that after ovulation to the end of the cycle. So if you chose to use progesterone for Jane, this is how you would write that prescription, P4 at 30 milligrams per mil. We're doing number 30. We're applying one milliliter to thin skin areas, days 15 to menses with two refills. You do wanna make sure you give patients enough refills to make it to the next appointment. Not too many that you never see them again, um, but initially you might wanna retest her at that two to three month mark so you can um, help time it to help bring them back in so you can monitor that treatment, okay? And then if the therapeutic levels are reached after that initial test, you can move to maybe annual testing thereafter or testing every six months, right? You can spread that out to a longer time frame. So this is Jane's testosterone level. I would consider uh, this to be optimal. You can see the range goes from six to 49, somewhere kind of in the mid range area to kind of bottom third, I think is, is typically normal. Um, her DHEA though is overtly low. So we want to consider DHEA supplementation probably, but we always just want to keep in mind, Hey, what are the testosterone levels and what are her estradiol levels? Remember, cause we could be pushing all three of those. So her estradiol level is 1.9. I think that's a beautiful number. We're safely within the reference range. Her testosterone is also right there. So we can definitely use DHEA in this case. I'm going to do, in addition to what we already have so far, five milligrams orally for her. Uh, remember with women, you don't need a lot of DHEA. Typically over the counter dosages are somewhere in the 20 to 50 range. And those were uh, studied just in men. So women don't need that much. Looking at Jane's cortisol levels, you can see a really clear example here of phase one dysfunction. She's got an interesting pattern here. It's an inverse curve. So we would expect cortisol to be highest 30 minutes after waking up and then gradually dropping off. So following this green area in the curve. And she has the opposite of that. She has high cortisol right before bed, low cortisol in the morning. Cortisol and melatonin should be opposing each other. And Jane's 
report does reflect this, but both are an inverse curve. So her cortisol levels are rising at bedtime. They shouldn't be doing that. Her melatonin is not rising at bedtime when it should be. So we want to address both of these. We can do that by adding HPA access support, the product, um, say, in the morning and at noon to help normalize those cortisol levels in the pattern. Typically, that's including B vitamins, maybe vitamin C and adaptogenic botanicals. Phosphorylated serine at bed is one of the few things can, can actually help to dampen elevated cortisol levels. So doing that at nighttime will be really helpful. And then we're talking to her about sleep hygiene, avoiding artificial light in the evening to try to um, accommodate her melatonin circadian rhythm there. Exposing her to sunlight in the morning is going to be amazing. Probably one of the most powerful things that you can do and help to reset cortisol and melatonin secretion. And then actually giving melatonin at night will also help to regulate that endogenous secretion over time and help to um, provide antioxidant support and help sleep. This is our next patient, Sally. She's 56 years old. She's gone through surgical menopause. She's had a complete hysterectomy and oophorectomy six years ago. She has been taking 30 milligrams of topical progesterone for about the last six months, but she's still having residual symptoms. So she has sugar cravings, fatigue, hot flashes, forgetfulness, and vaginal dryness. She's postmenopausal, so I'm going to run a comprehensive plus profile here, which is going to give me the addition of estrone and estradiol plus that calculated estrogen quotient, which is um, nice because it's considered to be a breast cancer risk marker. And in the case for postmenopausal women, that you know risk just goes up. And so great to always get that in your postmenopausal patients. So this is her test from a bird's eye view. We see her symptoms reflected here on her questionnaire. I always like to look at this. She's got severe fatigue, sugar cravings, hot flashes, night sweats, incontinence. We all associate that with um, low estradiol, vaginal dryness, and then difficulty concentrating in foggy thinking, you see. She didn't really mention that previously, but that fits with kind of a um, low sex hormone picture. And again, she's using 30 milligrams of transdermal progesterone. So um, we're going to take a peek and see if she filled this out correctly. She did progesterone, lovely, topical, 12 to 24 hours prior to this collection date right there. Great. And she's telling us that she does this once per day. Wonderful. Sally gets a gold star. She did this correctly. So we know that the levels we're looking at are going to be solid for interpretation. Okay, so these are her estrogens. Estrone looks fine. She's got suboptimal estradiol. And taking into consideration her estrogen deficiency symptoms, you might think about estradiol supplementation. That would be probably high on my list. Estrogen quotient is low, so I would love to consider a bias formulation here or at least provide estri estriol to treat the vaginal dryness um, that would support estrogen quotient as well. So if we're choosing hormone therapy, how do we dose that? Uh, typically one milligram of bias in a four to one ratio of E3 to E2, super common dose can be for, divided in BID dosing too if there's a lot of hot flashes and night sweats, okay? So that gives a little bit more of a steady, stable dose over a 24 hour period. You can also do a bias 50-50 formulation. Some providers like that. I think that's totally fair. If you're giving vaginal estri estriol, you might want to um, do that one milligram, you know, each night before bed for one to two weeks, and then doing one to four times per week after that to maintain tissue levels. Okay. And let's take a look at her estradiol in relation to progesterone. This is the PG to E2 ratio. And if you recall, this patient was already on progesterone when she came into the office. So her therapeutic level looks really good. If we give bias to this patient, remember, it's going to bring down the PG to E2 ratio. So we might want to increase her progesterone uh, proactively to keep that in range. Uh, remember that progesterone can also help with vasomotor and cognitive symptoms that happen during menopause. So we're going to give 40 milligrams. We're going to increase that by 10 milligrams uh, to counterbalance the effects of the supplemented estradiol that's now being prescribed. Technically, Sally does not have a uterus, so the conventional system would not be concerned about providing a progestogen agent. And in fact, they would advise against it. My argument is that they're looking at the progestin research. We certainly don't want to give her that. That's going to increase uh, 
the risks outweigh, outweigh the benefit if she doesn't have a uterus. But when we're talking about bioidentical progesterone, my argument is that we're affecting the brain, the bones, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, all of that's going to be beneficial. Now, if she did have a uterus, you'd probably want to go for that oral progesterone of at least 100 milligrams each night before bed. I will sometimes do um, both of those. So remember I said oral progesterone is 100 milligram. Oral progesterone of 100 milligrams is probably roughly equivalent to 10 milligrams topical. So we could have increased this to 50 milligrams topically. But the addition of 40 milligrams topically and 100 milligrams oral would be equivalent to 50 milligrams topically, if that makes sense, because the oral uh, 100 milligrams is roughly equivalent to 10 milligrams topically. Okay. Um, you may have noticed her elevated testosterone. Uh, exogenous exposure is probably going to be the first thing you always want to rule out. There is a place on the questionnaire that asks patients if they have anyone in their household using topical hormones. Sally marked no there. So that kind of takes that out a little bit easier. Um, if you do have exogenous exposure, know that the testosterone level will probably show quite a bit higher than what we're seeing here, like in the hundreds usually. Um, so slight elevations in androgens usually indicate metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, even just very mild early red flag that might lead to prediabetes or even diabetes at some point. So this is really an opportunity to talk to the patient about lifestyle, exercise, maybe a low glycemic index diet. And then you could consider further testing like vitamin D. Vitamin D in normal physiologic levels has been shown to sensitize insulin receptors. So if her vitamin D is low, you can easily provide that and help with that regard. Maybe looking at hemoglobin A1C or fasting glucose, fasting insulin, things like that. So this is what we added to the treatment plan, vitamin D and specific diet and exercise prescription. Um, if the testing revealed actual like prediabetes or diabetes, you might want to do a little bit more targeted treatment, but for her, it was quite early on. And so it, the treatment is less extensive. DHEA is low. I'm going to avoid giving DHEA at this time because her testosterone is already elevated. I don't really want to be pushing that any further. I'd rather get that down first and then potentially in the future, bring DHEA on. So plan remains the same. This is how you're going to write the script for that compounded formula for Sally. Um, it's a bias with progesterone combination, and you can do twice a day dosing because of those vasomotor symptoms. You could also give this very same hormone uh, combination sublingually, and this is how you would write that. And we'll look at her cortisol level. Remember, she's talking about severe fatigue and sugar cravings. This is her dionyl cortisol level. And you can see the healthy curve here is lacking. This is a, a kind of a flat line example of phase three HPX dysfunction. So more extensive has been going on for a longer period of time. Treatment considerations, certainly HPX support, B vitamins, adaptogenic botanicals, morning and noon. Potentially hydrocortisone, 10 milligrams in the morning, five at noon. We're going to avoid supplementing more than 20 milligrams in a total day because we don't want to cause uh, suppression of that HP axis function and even the immune system. So um, we've added that here, 10 milligrams in the morning, five at noon. One more case, and I will wrap things up here. So this is David, 46-year-old man presenting with erectile dysfunction, low libido, fatigue, and cognitive concerns. This is a comprehensive hormone profile. I didn't choose the comprehensive plus in this case because there's no established reference range for the estrogen quotient in men. Please know that you are welcome to order it for men, but do know that the reference ranges won't populate for the estrogen quotient. Okay. His symptom questionnaire here, talking about elevated total cholesterol and triglycerides, low libido, uh, all of those indicate decreased androgen levels. You can see he's got numerous adrenal function symptoms on um, the left, low energy all day long. He's also marking some uh, symptoms that are associated with prostate issues. So estradiol for David looks really nice. I like that 1.1. It should be less than 2.5. He's quite under that. Um, he has what I call wiggle room, which makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. 
His progesterone level looks normal for a male. You can see that there's no reference range for the PG to E2 ratio for David. And this is because that ratio is a clinical construct. It's not a physiologic ratio. You'll only be able to bring that into a normal range by supplementing progesterone. You might wanna do that in cases where there's prostate symptoms like with David. So in this case, progesterone supplementation is uh, a consideration. And then testosterone, it is technically within range, but you can see it's hugging the very bottom of that range, which is generally considered suboptimal. I would really encourage you to, to run enough of these tests where you have your own opinion as to where optimal is. I think we can all have slightly different opinions on that, and I don't want to lock you into a black and white kind of uh, optimal level but you can see that's generally reasonable, right? He's at the very bottom of the range and the symptoms fit. So certainly we can consider testosterone uh, supplementation or at least trying to get that testosterone level up naturally. Chrysin um, has aromatase inhibition effects, so can help block the conversion of testosterone to estradiol. So I'm gonna include that in David's formula, but basically I'm just choosing, going right here to the men section, five to 10 milligrams per day of progesterone and 10 to 20 milligrams of testosterone along with chrysin. And we're going to do this topically. We're going to be very um, determined in counseling him that to lower the risk of transference to anyone in the household. You may choose if you don't feel that your patients can be really careful about that to only do injection by testosterone. I think that would be fair as well. Okay. Remind David the time of the day that he applies the cream should be the time of the day when he's less likely to come into contact with spouse, partner, children, pets in order to avoid that transference. He needs to be careful about hand washing and contaminating surfaces um, of the house. There are lifestyle factors here. Remember, testosterone does require a DEA number, so it's not going to be an option for all providers, but we have some non-hormonal options listed here. These are all quite effective, and I would argue should probably be done alongside testosterone replacement anyhow. So there's herbals, uh, there's zinc, and lifestyle support. DHEA, very low. I consider this functionally low. See, he's hugging the very bottom of that range, so certainly DHEA supplementation to help support testosterone as well and provide DHEA in and of itself. So typical dose is somewhere between 10 and 25 milligrams orally. This is his cortisol curve, probably looks a little bit better than the other two we saw today so far that AM and noon cortisol levels are suboptimal. The others are within range, so it's considered a phase two dysfunction. Um, you might look at this and think, hey, that's, that's not too bad, right? But you always have the option of adding on a cortisol awakening response or the CAR. You can see we've done that here. We've added the waking and the AM60 to this otherwise just AM30 value. The CAR is kind of considered a mini stress test. So when patients are not adequately responding to the stress of waking up, their HP axis function is more significant and then the, what the diurnal curve might otherwise indicate. So this cortisol awakening response leads me to understand that we could probably um, you know, focus on his HPA axis more than we might have otherwise. So along with um, the typical kind of HPA axis support supplements, which we're adding in B vitamins, adaptogens, we're gonna be talking about that blunted car and talking about um, more direct stress management, lifestyle considerations, mindfulness, self-care. Sometimes men can easily, you know, just push, push, push and, and, and overlook those things. So to summarize here, we're getting towards the end. Thank you so much for your patience. We're going to be monitoring treatment. So testing at baseline and then two to three months after is always a nice idea. Maybe every six months to once per year after that, once you get things in a really good place, uh, just to check in and make sure nothing's gone awry. Quick note about testing patients on oral contraceptives. Um, hormonal birth control works by suppressing ovulation. So that's going to result in a state of progesterone insufficiency, sometimes low estradiol and suboptimal testosterone as well. The progestins within the birth control pills are not measured by the laboratory uh, systems. They're measuring just bioidentical hormone that's produced by the body or supplemented. So 
the progesterone level that you're going to find is reflective of endogenous production. It's going to be low because it's under the influence of that hormone suppression caused by the pill. So the hormone testing while on oral contraceptives, I would argue, is just going to elucidate that the pill is suppressing ovulation. Most results are going to look low. I find them to not be clinically helpful. I can just tell the patient ahead of time what those levels are going to be. You might have a patient that really just loves to see the data and the black and white numbers, and that would be a reason. Um, but just so you know, it, it's going to be fairly predictable as to what those levels will be. I did want to make brief mention of the hormone um, and urinary metabolite assessment profile we have called HUMAP. Um, lots of questions come up about this. It is my opinion that it's not the best test to use for prescribing and monitoring hormone doses. Like, am I giving my patient the correct dose? Now, we can monitor how that's moving through the body and how the pattern and the direction that that's happening and uh, metabolism health, absolutely. But if you're questioning, is my patient on the appropriate dose, and it's a transdermal hormone specifically, you're really going to be better served with saliva testing. Okay. Uh, again, if you want to learn more about this and you have more questions about that, I would go back to that January webinar where we talk about the various testing mediums, serum, urine, and saliva, and compare them all in, in good detail. And then we do have an entire Wellness Wednesday lecture dedicated to the HUMAP coming up in August. So don't miss that one. That one's going to be really amazing. Uh, there is a best practices too for this HUMAP specimen. So I just want to delineate that they are two, two different tests and give you two different sides of the same equation of this hormone story in our patients. So lastly, always check the dosage interval when you're interpreting re the results. Look at that if your patient's on hormone therapy. Always check their last menstrual period if they're menstruating. Make sure they timed that correctly. Make sure nobody else in their household or in their life is using topicals. That's going to help you avoid that. Uh, questioning some of those high results. And then use that symptom questionnaire to help guide you in um, optimal levels, right? Like we have black and white numbers, but we really have to take that into the setting and consideration of what our parent patient is experiencing too. And the combination of that becomes really powerful. So then it's less about what is this perfect black and white number that is somewhat uh, nuanced. And you'll just get that information as you continue to do these tests. Um, then know that the interpretation notes on that laboratory report is going to help guide your treatment. So there's many resources on our website, a plethora, but you can certainly call us if you want to consult with us. Uh, myself and our uh, team of staff docs here are happy to help you. So thank you so much for that. I know that was a lot of information and I'll turn it over if we have any time for questions.